I'd like to spend my time this afternoon talking about business ethics. And most specifically, can you teach business ethics? Now, this is a topic that's very important to me because I do teach business ethics. Now, when I originally started teaching the course, I had friends ask me, so what do you do? And I tell them, well, one of the classes that I teach is business ethics. And I would hear a lot more cynicism in their voices and their response than I had anticipated, and it made me a little uneasy. I heard people say that it was an oxymoron. I asked, uh, what did you mean by that? And they say, well, my understanding of business is that you do everything that you can to make one extra nickel, regardless of what happens and who it hurts and all that kind of stuff. And that, so that bothered me. That bothered me a lot. Because I like to think that I'm using my time wisely in the classroom. And I spend a lot of time thinking about what I'm going to do in the classroom to get different ideas across to widen people's thoughts about what's going on around them. And also, I should tell you, I'm not a very patient person. So when I heard people say that, well, you know, I'm not sure that you can even teach that, how would you go about it? I set off to, to really explore that question. I hadn't really thought of it before, but I hadn't considered seriously whether you could teach a topic like that. So I started off a very traditional method. I, I selected a textbook and a series of case studies because I wanted to be interactive in the classroom. And the textbooks started off looking rather interesting. The stories were engaging. I mean, who doesn't like hearing about lying, cheating, stealing, all these kind of things? I think the textbook writers look for the worst stories of corporate behavior to try and make their point. And the case studies, I thought, would work really well. So a typical case study class, we would talk about it and I would try and lead the class through a series of questions that basically got to the point at the end of the class where we could sit back and say, so why did this happen? Why did this individual engage in this kind of behavior? And usually, the class would go by very well. We'd, students would say, well, you know, they did this and they did this and they made a decision here and it probably wasn't the best. And I felt like I was getting somewhere. And then I started asking at the end, because I wanted to push it just a little bit, so let's talk about if, if you were in this situation, what would happen? And then, and then the class didn't get so well in my, in my opinion. A lot of times, more often than I was comfortable with, the students would say, well, I wouldn't do that. Obviously, I wouldn't do that. I'm a good person. I'm honest. I would never falsify reports. I would never compromise my integrity. I would never lie. And, and I thought right there, well, OK, I'm glad that you feel that way. But I suspect that that's not the whole story. So I started off thinking, well, Textbooks, maybe not the best way that you could actually teach a topic like this. So I went on plan B. And I thought, what's really missing here is the opportunity to experience the decision and then have to live with the outcome. So I started thinking of how can I create a classroom experience or a student experience that would give people the opportunity to choose to be bad. And so I came up with this assignment. I called Truth and Lies. So early on in my class, I tell the students, pick a week, and one day you have to tell nothing but the truth to everybody that you meet. And I get kind of, just like this, I get kind of smiles and, oh, that sounds like it would be uncomfortable. Uh, and I tell them, take notes, because there's an essay due at the end, and we'll talk about it uh, the following week. And they're all kind of getting used to it. Okay, I can do that. And I tell them, wait, if there's a truth day, there's a lie day. Another day in this week, tell everybody that you meet at least one lie. And now, so now they start getting, oh, uh, okay, and off they go. So the week goes on, uh, class comes back, essays are handed in. Usually got, typically the last few years that I've been doing this, I've been doing this for several years, average of about 95% completion rate. So for the professors out there, I mean, that's good, right? I assign an essay, 95% of the students finish it. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good rate. Uh, so we get into the class and we start talking about, you know, what is it, how did you define what it meant to tell the truth? Did it, was there spots that were uncomfortable that you weren't expecting that truth was, you know, not your first go-to? And, and then I would ask them, well, so how did you define what non-truths were, what lies were? And we would go through the whole progression of, of lies of omission, those were always popular. Well, I knew I should have said this, but I chose not to, so I counted that as a lie, and then I went off with the rest of the day. 
So, yeah, okay. So it was really useful in getting people to think through the difference between telling the truth and not telling the truth. And so we would talk about different definitions and things like that. And then we would get to the end of the class. And then I would ask them, just almost going out of the room, I would ask them, oh, one more thing. Why did you do that? Why did you do that essay? And they would say, well, I'm not sure what you're asking me. What do you mean, why did I do that essay? You assigned it. And I said, well, let's think about this for a minute. Let's unpack it a little. I asked you to go out and lie to everybody that you meet in one particular day. Your friends, family, co-workers, strangers on the street, whoever. You've known me, and it's early on in the class, and I tell some of you, you've only known me for a few weeks, and, you know, I'm, I'm just some some guy who walks in here at the start of the class and starts talking. But yet I was able to get almost all of you to, to lie. How many of you would have guessed that ahead of time? And so, so I get two responses. Number one is, oh, I never thought about that. I did it because you assigned it to me. I did it because, you know, I didn't know we had a choice. I did it for the marks. This was actually really funny. The very first time I did this, I'd get a lot of them saying, well, I did it for the marks. Now, that's a very true economic response. I, I responded to incentives. And I thought, I'm pretty sure that a lot of you didn't do it. You may think that you did, but I'll bet you that you didn't. So in subsequent years, I wanted to be able to take that argument off the table. So I started reducing the amount of marks that the essay was worth. Last time I taught this course, the essay was worth 1%. So consider this for a moment. One week of work, 1,500 word essay, one mark. Some professors give more than one mark for showing up for class for one day. I asked them, so did that not seem a little cheap? And, and I mean, that opened up the floodgates. Yeah, that was awful. We talked about it. We thought you're like the cheapest professor ever. <laughs> he says, yeah. See, I'm pretty sure that it wasn't for the marks. So I thought about this number two. Um, 95% of the students would do it, and I thought, well, okay, it seems like it's maybe a little bit better response or a little bit more true to life than just reading in a book, but there was something still missing. So I started creating a pop quiz. So here's what the pop quiz was. Halfway through the course, I'd arranged with the associate dean in our business faculty. His name's David. He's a very official-looking man. Uh, gray hair, beard, always wears a suit and tie, kind of a quiet authority. And at the start of one class, he would knock on the door, and I would act surprised, like, oh, David, what can I do for you? And he says, uh, I'd like you to help. We're behind on our accreditation process. I've got a memo here that requires uh, some signatures of the students. And it's a very simple memo. It just says, yes, the program has a business ethics course, and yes, these are the topics. Everybody signs it. The accreditation bureau is happy, and we can all go on our way. So he just walks in and puts the memo down with the first students, and they go around, and they start signing it. So consider what we're asking the students to do here. We're asking them to compromise their integrity, because we're asking them to sign a memo that says, yes, I took this class, and I took all these topics, but they've only taken half the topics so far. They'd have to trust us that, yes, I trust the professor. We're not going to lose a day or whatever. Uh, we're going to do all these. And I thought, you know, I can make that even a little bit more of an experience. So some of the topics in the second half of the course on this memo, absolute nonsense. Like I randomly took businessy words and strung them together. <laughs> and so at the end of the class, typically around 75% of the students sign. And so David takes his memo, uh, walks out the door, and I immediately turn around in the face of class and I ask him, so why did you sign that? And right away it's like, oh, I can't believe that I did that. And oh. And so we talk more about, well, why did you do it? And I got a lot of the same answers. Uh, well, we, it was expected of us. We didn't know that we had a choice. The person beside me signed it and all these kind of things. So I wasn't quite satisfied yet. There was still something missing. They, the students didn't seem to really be uh, not engaging, but, but thinking through what they were doing. Now, there's one particular episode that happened when I was doing the pop quiz that really stands out in my mind. And, and, and solidified for me that you can think about it and read about it all you want, you can experience it, but something's going on that can make you do things that you normally wouldn't do. So one time, a few years ago, uh, the class starts, afternoon class, these three students come walking in, and right away you can tell something's up because they're way too happy to be there. They sit down and the class starts, 
the associate dean comes walking in. The memo goes around. It makes its way to these three fellows that are on, on my left. And the first, the first guy picks it up, and he's looking at it, and he's got this grin on his face, and he's not signing it. And so the associate dean walks over very slowly and taps on the memo by this guy's name and says, please sign this. So this guy picks up his pen, signs it, hands it to his buddy. His buddy picks up his pen, signs it, hands it to the third guy. Third guy signs it, and the memo is gone. They could not get rid of that piece of paper fast enough. So I asked him at the end about, you know, so what was going on? What, why, why did it look like you guys had something up your sleeve? And the one fellow says, well, we heard from someone who's taken the class before what was going to happen. So we thought, ah, oh, this is our chance. We're going to turn the tables, and we're going to get everybody to refuse to sign. And so his theory was that if they made a show of saying, no, this isn't right, we're not going to do it, that it would trigger the, everybody else in the room to say, yeah, we don't have to sign this. Psh. And so I thought, in my mind, I'm thinking, that would have been great. We could have talked about the social influences and all this kind of stuff. So I asked him, so what happened? And he just looked up at me like, well, the associate dean looks so important. <laughs> we didn't think we had a choice. So something happened right there. Their brain came apart and they just reacted. And I started thinking, okay, can you teach this? You can't teach it in the book. The experience is getting there. About 75% of the students sign it, but that's still a high number. And I started thinking more about how can you get people to, to act the way that they believe in. And so this is the point that I'm at right now. And so I've got this working theory that I'm putting into, into place for my class going forward. I think there's two things that influence us over and above responding to incentives and things like that. Why don't people think more about the action directly in front of them? So I think there's two parts. One of them is cultural, one of them is social. And the cultural part is being in the classroom, for example. There's, there's rules, they're unwritten, but they're very strong rules. The professor assigns work, students do it. Uh, we talk about the results, they get a grade. It's all very understood. There's also a strong social element to it. I've been assigned it, the person beside me has been assigned it, the person beside me has also been assigned it. We all do it. If we choose not to, we're gonna forego the marks, but it's not like we have a lot of choice here. So I started thinking, okay, how can you get people to start thinking beyond, or sorry, reacting beyond the cultural and the social influences? And so I've, I've come up, and I'll present it to you here, I've come up with these three questions. It has to do with what, would, and how. What, would, and how. So what, I, what I'd like to do is get the students to start thinking about what is it that I'm being asked to do, or what is it that I'm considering to, to do? So with the truth and lies assignment, I mean, let's be honest, what am I being asked to do? I'm being asked to go out and lie to people I care about. Okay, that really strips it away. I'm being asked to go out and lie to people that I care about. Would I do this in other situations? Hmm, would I do it if it wasn't an assignment? Would I do it for another professor? Would I do it at work? Would I, just would I? And I think by splitting those questions down into what am I being asked and would I do this in other situations informs the next question. How am I going to act right now? Now, I don't believe for a moment that going through any kind of mental process is going to make everybody suddenly more virtuous. But what I want to do is get people starting to think more about the decisions that they're making and thinking explicitly about them. What am I being asked? So here's my challenge for everyone in the room here. I'm going to call it the, the co-worker test. So we can all play a mental experiment. I like, well, I don't want to know the results, but I'm curious how you would, uh, how you would play this out. So let's say that uh, you go back to the office, you go to the office tomorrow, and your coworker has left you a note or an email saying, uh, would you mind telling the boss that I was at TEDx with you yesterday afternoon when, when they weren't? Okay, so how would you deal with that? So, number one, what? What are you being asked to do? Regardless of all of the social niceties around it, you're being asked to not tell the truth. You're being asked to lie. Would you do it? Uh, would you do it in other circumstances? Would you do it if it was a different coworker? Would you do it if it was a coworker that you didn't like? Would you do it for your boss? Now, once you have those two thoughts in mind, what am I being asked to do and would I do this in other circumstances? Uh, then I think it starts to get interesting. How am I going to act? 
I think by bringing these questions more to the surface, it'll give us a little bit more of an ability to uh, work in a more principled workplace. So in my journey so far, the textbooks, I don't think you can read about it. The experience maybe helps a little bit, but I don't think it really captures the essence of how we think we should act. It's only by stepping back and asking, stripped away of all the social niceties, what am I being asked to do, that I think can start to regain some of the uh, prestige of being in business. And if that's the outcome that I can get in my classroom, then I would be pretty satisfied with that. Thank you.